All right, so welcome again. This video is going to talk a little bit about x-rays from the second lecture of the, the uh, first week. We all want x-ray vision, so the uh, first uh, step to uh, getting that is understanding the uh, how x-rays are generated. What are the two main mechanisms, breaking radiation and characteristic radiation? We'll go through those. We'll go through what is the Oja electron thing going on. Let's start. Generation of x-ray, and I like to uh, draw stuff from scratch. That way I find it easier to understand how they work. So this is my x-ray tube on one side. I have the <clears throat> anode, which is positively charged. And on the other side, I have my cathode, which is negatively charged. Nope. Negatively charged. Perfect. And inside the x-ray tube, I have vacuum which is really important to have because we don't want electrons moving around, hitting and bouncing off of air particles and losing energy. <clears throat> so we're going to have a vacuum there. So what happens now? The cathode is heated. When it's heated, electrons are liberated. And these electrons are accelerating through this voltage difference inside the x-ray tube. They're accelerated towards the positive anode and they interact with the anode material. And with this interaction, we get x-ray photons. Well, there's two main mechanisms that we're going to go through. Breaking radiation and characteristic. Both important to understand. Now, what's also important to understand is that these guys, they accelerate, they're moving, so they have kinetic energy. All right? And how much kinetic energy are they going to have? Well, the more the difference is, the higher the difference between the anode and the cathode, the, higher, the faster these guys are going to be moving. So the greater the, the difference between the voltage, the potential difference, the faster or the more kinetic energy the electrons will have. Let's just say I have 10 volts in my tube. My electrons are going to be accelerating and having 10 electron volts of kinetic energy, whereas if I have 20 volts, the equivalency is having 20 electron volts for each electron as far as kinetic energy. And this whole idea of electron volt, it is in the minimal. <clears throat> I believe they say that it is a measure of energy. One electron volt is equivalent to the amount of energy gained by a single electron accelerated through a voltage difference of one. That's just under basic physical concepts. So this is how x-ray is generated. Let's go a little bit into the details of it. So we said that I have a cathode here, and I know that this, this whole depiction seems daunting right now, but we're going to break it up and see how easy it can be. So we already, we already know our electrons are accelerating from the cathode towards the anode material. And this is my electron here, and it's accelerated, and it hit the orbitals inside the atom, the electron orbitals. It lost some of its energy as this photon here, and it had some energy left kept going. And again, interacted with the orbitals, lost some energy, kept going until it reached zero. And what's interesting is, let's just paint a picture where I have, this is my, this is one, perfect. This is my initial kinetic energy. I have 100% energy. I just got my energy and I started accelerating through the voltage difference. I hit the anode material. Let's just say I lost 20% of my energy. I have 80% left, and 20% was emitted as a photon. And here, let's say I, have, I lost 40% in this second interaction, so I have 40% left. And let's just say in this one, I lost 35%, and now I have only 5. And that'll keep going until I get to 0. So what's the interesting, the take-home message is that if we take a look at these photons, they have different energy levels, different frequencies. That means that I can, add, I can have a variety of frequencies generated by this breaking radiation. Why? Because there is a series of interactions. So due to a series of interactions, I'm missing an off here, series of interactions, we can have a variety of frequencies. Now, can there be an instance in which the whole 100% of energy, let's just say this is my atom, this is my nucleus, 
the whole 100% of energy, while it's being interacted, is going to get out as a photon of 100%? Yes, it is possible, and there's a good term for that. It's in the minimals. It's called F max, the maximal frequency. And what do we mean by that? If I have 100% of energy here, I can lose it in, in a series of interactions, but it could happen that I may lose it in one interaction, and the whole 100% is going to be emitted as a photon, and that photon is going to be the most powerful photon I can make with this energy. Thus, it is going to have the highest frequency. It's going to be the maximal frequency. And we already mentioned that if I want to get more energy, I want to get more F max, I need to have more kinetic energy, so I need to have a higher voltage difference in my tube. And it's important to understand, and what helps us understand it, is this graph right here. And I promise it's not that difficult to understand. First of all, let's fix this thing here. I see it should be kilovolts. <clears throat> Perfect. So, what happens here? Let's take a look at our expression F max. Now, how do we calculate? How do we solve for what our maximal frequency can be? We said that it relates to the amount of energy that we have for our electrons, right? So it just so happens that the equation is the energy of the electron over Planck's constant. And that is in the minimals. That is how we can calculate for our F max. And being that our frequency, the higher the frequency, the lower the wavelength, length, or the lower the lambda, the F max is the same as saying lambda min. And this is what we have here. And the reason, the reason that they have it as two different ex expressions is beyond me, but they did choose to use both lambda min and the F max. They're both. One of them is in the presentation, one of them is in the minimals. But it's important to understand that they're both the same thing. If I have a minimal wavelength, it is going to be my maximal frequency. And it should make a little bit of a sense. <coughs> so what's going on here? Let's just say I accelerated my electrons through a potential difference of 10 kilovolts. That would mean these electrons would have 10 kilo electron volts of energy. And these guys are going to be able to generate the F max or the lambda min. It's the same thing at this point. And the further this point shifts to the left, the more energetic that photon is going to be. And the further it shifts to the right, the less energetic that photon is going to be. And it's limited by the amount of potential difference or kinetic energy of the electrons. That makes sense. But well, what do we have here? We can see that we can actually get either this F max or any other value right of it. That means I can have photons from 100%, which is my F max, to 0%. Obviously not inclusive because there isn't a photon of zero energy. But I can get anywhere between this, these two values. That means I'm going to have a broad spectrum, a continuous, continuous spectrum. And that's really important to understand about breaking radiation. It is continuous. So what's this red curve right above it? If I up the uh, voltage in the X-ray tube, I'm going to have more energetic electrons, and they would potentially be able to get me more uh, higher frequency, more energetic uh, photons. This is the lambda min, and the further it goes to the left, the more energy it has. So just to address this y-axis, what it means is that the higher the point here on the y-axis, the more photons are going to be generated for this frequency. So if this frequency is x, when I apply 20 kilovolts, I will observe most photons are going to be of x frequency. Obviously, it's possible to get the, min the maximal frequency, but we're not going to observe it very often. So what's important to understand, I'm going to add this because it's very critical, breaking radiation, series of interactions, and continuous continuous spectrum. This occurs, this, this is brought up a lot in self-controls, especially the first ones. So breaking radiation, let's consider what may happen in a characteristic radiation.
what is characteristic radiation? And it should pop up, and I'm just going to put it right here. It's characteristics, characteristic, characteristic of what? The material of the anode. And what do I mean by that? We said that these electrons, they actually interact with the orbitals, the electrons in the orbitals of these atoms. So this is the atom of the anode. This is the electron accelerating towards it. And what happens is that it generates a vacancy in the K-shell, the inner shell. And you don't really need to remember all the aberrations for um, abbreviations for each of these orbitals, but it's good to know that the K-shell is the innermost shell. So it causes the ionization of this guy. That means I'm not going to have an electron here. This electron accelerated from the cathode hit the K-shell electron and ionized it. It's gone. Now, a very important thing, and we also learned this in chemistry, is that you can't have a vacancy in the lower shell. You're going to have to have that vacancy filled. So we can have this electron drop down to here and fill the vacancy. We can also have this electron drop down and fill the vacancy. But what would always happen is, whenever these guys, in characteristic radiation, when these guys drop down to fill the vacancy, energy is liberated as a photon. And let's spread this apart. Let's open this up. I'm going to draw the energy levels. This is also uh, somewhere in uh, the lecture slides. Let's say this is the K shell. This is the L. This is the M. This is the N. And I said that I have a, a vacancy in the K shell. That means some of these guys, one of these guys is going to drop down and fill it. So this guy can drop down and fill it. Or this guy. Or this guy. And what we need to understand about orbitals is that these distances, these energy levels are set. They're not continuous. They can't assume any value. They can only assume these values. These values are set. And they're characteristic of these energy levels of the material. That means that in characteristic radiation, you would get, this is the expression here, discrete energy levels, discrete energy levels emitted as photons. This is also um, referred to a lot in biostats, but we shouldn't really, we don't really need to get into that now. But discrete means packs of energy. Can't assume any value, just a specific value. Let's take a look at that graph again. Now, we have the breaking radiations from before, but we notice something interesting here, something different. We have these two peaks. You can see them. They're very, very obvious. These two peaks are right here. This frequency and this frequency, or wavelength. It's the same thing, really. So we're going to have these two specific photons of these two specific energy levels. We can't have anything in between them here because it's not interaction that lose it's not an interaction due to series of interaction. It's not energy liberation due to series of interaction. It's energy liberated due to the specific difference in energy levels between the respective electron orbitals within the anode material. And you can also see that we can ha also have um, regular breaking radiation. But when we up the charge, we up the voltage in the anode, uh, sorry, in the um, x-ray tube between the cathode and the anode, what we will see potentially is these characteristic peaks, these characteristic radiation photons. And these would always be discrete. So what's important to understand is this in characteristic radiation, there is a vacancy in the K shell, vacancy in the K shell that is obviously going to be filled by an electron from a higher shell. It is going to exhibit discrete, discrete photons. And this characteristic radiation is usually not used in day-to-day uh, -day imaging of, uh, let's just say, I broke my arm, I need to go get an x-ray. That's not the kind of radiation that you'd encounter. Characteristic radiation is more for um, imaging of different materials, like in crystallography, and we'll get to that as well. So the difference between characteristic, characteristics and breaking, breaking radiation, series of interactions, 
continuous spectrum characteristic radiation. There's one interaction right here, vacancy in the K shell and discrete photon frequency or energy. You can think about it in whatever way you want. Perfect. So uh, let's finish off with the concept of Ohia electrons. This is actually pretty simple to understand because this whole process starts with this process. This means I'm going to have an electron accelerating really quickly. Say I have an outer electron accelerating really quickly. And you guessed it, it's going to ionize an inner K shell electron. So this guy's gone. Now we already mentioned that we can't have a vacancy. So this vacancy is going to be filled. So this guy is going to drop down here. So far, it's the exact same as characteristic radiation. And at this point, if a photon was to be emitted, it would be a characteristic photon. But what happens now is that this energy that is liberated is imparted to an electron at a higher orbital. And this electron suddenly is bursting with energy and is shooting off, could be in any direction, shooting off of the respective orbital. And again, we have a vacancy here. So if we take a look at what happened, and we can actually say that we lost two electrons, so to speak. We lost two electrons. And just to go through this again, what happened here? Let's go through this again. An electron accelerated in the X-ray tube caused an ionization of an electron in an orbital in the inner K shell orbital, this electron is gone. And now this electron is dropping down to fill in the gap. Now, instead of having that energy released as a photon, what happens is that energy is being imparted to an outer orbital electron that comes shooting out and is also ionized out of the material. And this is Ohia electrons. Now what you really need to understand, and uh, I like to uh, finish off with minimals, is that the minimal that we went through, we went through it, I didn't introduce it as a minimal. This formula right here, this is a minimal requirement question. Let's go through it real quick. Define the limiting frequency of breaking radiation at an accelerated voltage of V. And the maximal frequency is going to be linearly proportional to the energy of that electron. That means, let's just draw this here again. And the whole linearly proportional, inversely proportional is really important to understand because they love to ask about it. Linearly proportional means that when I have higher energy of electrons, I would have a higher frequency. But the... Uh, the frequency and the, uh, and the energy of the electrons are dependent on the voltage inside the X-ray tube. And also, this is Planck's constant. Don't think it's a lambda or anything. And that's pretty much it. Hopefully you found this helpful. And I'll see you in the next video.